Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. This channel is dedicated to finding out whether I really do know it all or not. Make sure you like and subscribe, and also make sure you ask questions in the comments below or at my email address, which is at the end of the video or in the description below. So check it out and make sure you ask some questions. So without further ado, let's take a look at what the question of the day is. Drum roll, please. All right. Cool. This one's a follow-up question. I love it. So the question is, how do you solve NP-complete problems if you can't actually solve them? So good question. Uh, this is a follow-up question to last week's question of the week, which was, what is the difference between P versus NP? And I will put a link to it, I hopefully, right there. So hopefully it's popping up right there as we speak. Uh, anyway, so very good question. I'm going to do a teeny-weeny recap of last week's in case you don't feel like watching last week's video, but I highly recommend you watch that one and then watch this one if you don't know what P versus NP is. But anyway, um, this has to do with computer science and how difficult or easy it is to solve a given problem. So a P problem can be solved in polynomial time and that's relatively straightforward for a computer to do. It takes a lot of calculations, but as computers are good at calculations, it's relatively quick. An NP problem is non-polynomial time and that means it can be much more difficult to solve. And an NP complete problem is one where the solution, you can check the solution relatively quickly like in polynomial time, but it's essentially impossible to solve the problem uh, like within the age of the universe. So I talk about that in the other video, so make sure you watch it if you don't understand. Um, just as a slight refinement to last week's episode, NP-complete is also part of a, a group of problems called NP-hard. And I'll throw up a picture here that's a little bit more clear about this. Uh, NP hard actually intersects with NP problems. And it's anyway, <laughs> it's just a slight refinement of the um, diagram that I showed last week. And it just shows that like hard problems can become really, really hard, essentially. That's more or less what it is. But anyway, so the question is, you've got these problems that are essentially impossible to solve within the age of the universe but we need to have some kind of solutions to them, right? So the basic trick of this entire thing is that the problem can be solved in a approximate manner rather than an exact manner. So what does that mean? That means that you find a quote unquote good enough solution, which is probably why the person asking the question said solve in quotation marks as opposed to solve for real. There's a bunch of ways of doing this. Uh, it's sort of a... A good classic way of doing it would be called simulated annealing. And a lot of these have to do with um, machine learning type techniques or something. Uh, I'll, uh, so annealing in particular is a way of solving a problem in a similar manner to how you would cool steel. So as you cool iron ore or steel ore or something like that, it's a process called annealing. And what happens is it gets colder and colder and colder and the crystals actually form. And that's the process of annealing. Um, simulated annealing is a way of finding the minimum energy of a system in a manner similar to annealing. <laughs> so what does that mean? So I'll throw up a graphic here because I think a graphic makes it much, much easier to understand. Uh, essentially what happens is that you've got an energy minimum and you can see that here. And what you do is you start off in some random position in the uh, solution space, which is that there is a best answer, but you don't know where it is. So you start off in a random position. And what you effectively do is give the system energy at the beginning, which is quote unquote temperature, which is the same thing as the temperature in real annealing. And that means that this little dot, this little solution can jump around a lot at the beginning because there's a lot of temperature, which provides random motion to the uh, system. So it's looking for minimum energy. So it's trying to seek out the minimum energy through some sort of um, fitness function. Uh, but what it's doing is it's jumping around at the beginning because there's a lot of temperature variation and the temperature is throwing en energy into the system and it's causing this little search space to, to jump around. Um, what that does is that keeps you from getting stuck in a uh, false minimum, essentially. So what happens over time is that the temperature comes down and the little search space like thing starts to seek out the lowest place and it bounces around less and less as the temperature goes down. So the hope is you're actually going to find yourself at the true minimum um, value and that will be where you end up resting as the temperature drops down so much that there's no more any kind of like jumping out of the, uh, the little minimums that they could be in. So it could be in a local minimum, it could be in the maximum. 
or the minimum minimum, <laughs> the global minimum. Uh, anyway, that the hope is that you will find yourself in the global minimum. But even if you don't, you should end up someplace really close to the global minimum. So that's what you're looking for here. One interesting aspect of simulated annealing is that that is what computers like quantum computers are really, really good at. So D-Wave computers happen to be specialists at solving simulated annealing problems. So they're really good at finding the minimum energy in a system. In other words, finding that low point in the fitness function in very rapid time. And in a way that could actually, if those things can take over and become a little more general purpose, they can actually break an awful lot of the internet today. Because a lot of what we have is based on cryptographic work that assumes a classical computer where to try to find the exact solution to a problem could again take, you know, hundreds, tens of to hundreds of years. And so it's impossible for somebody to do it in a reasonable amount of time. Whereas a quantum computer could potentially do it in minutes or hours. Um, and that would just break the entire internet. So it's a rather interesting thing. Uh, topic for another day. If somebody wants to ask about quantum computers, that might actually be a good thing to ask about. But that's definitely one technique. There are other techniques that are similar in the sense that they are kind of good enough. Uh, another one would be using genetic algorithms. So if you can find a fitness function that is good at encapsulating what the actual fitness of this function is, in other words, that's that's the hard part, honestly, with a genetic algorithm, is trying to find a good fitness function that actually makes sense. But if you find that, you can utilize that fitness function by throwing a whole population of possible solutions at it. So without getting too specific, um, what you try to do is effectively you throw a whole bunch, like a hundred or a thousand or 10,000 potential solutions at the problem. You look at the fitness function after one generation and you see which ones do the best, come the closest in the fitness function to finding that low point again, energy wise. And then you actually reproduce those um, high probability solutions. So you you have sex. <laughs> you put them together. They they then uh, cross genes, quote unquote, and then you throw it through a random um, uh, mutation possibility so that it has a possibility of also mutating to some extent just with some random changes. And then you, again, reproduce a population of 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 or however many you want. But these are the higher fitness function uh, parts of the population from before. So essentially it's survival of the fittest. It's Darwinian evolution, but Darwinian evolution in a computer <laughs> trying to find a solution to a problem. Uh, this happens to be really, really good. It can find a lot of close to, if not ultimate minimum um, answers to a question. And the one problem with them is that they tend to be very, very slow. Uh, but an advantage is that you can actually make the fitness function another function. So you could actually potentially do simulated annealing inside of genetic algorithm. So you could throw a whole bunch of like beginning points of the search space of a simulated annealing problem, and that can be your population. Then you run the fitness function for a while and you see which one is working, which ones are working the best. You then reproduce those and create another population which is more fit and then start from those positions instead. So you could run a GA with another function like simulated annealing as the fitness function, and that can actually produce some really, really good results. So that's very, very cool. Uh, let's see, another possible solution. You can throw um, neural networks at it. Neural networks are good at, at discovering functions, any kind of arbitrary function. So that's another good possibility. Um, those are quite <laughs> intriguing in terms of the way they work. They're a little bit black box. Nobody knows exactly how they're working and that's actually an active area of research is to figure out how neural networks work. But more or less they mimic the brain and you're effectively training the brain to solve these problems. And again, given enough time and given enough complexity of the neural network architecture, it actually can solve the problem exactly. But even given the imperfections of having a relatively limited network and a limited amount of time, and a limited amount of data, you can still get really, really close to the exact solution, whatever that happens to be. One other possibility that's similar to genetic algorithms is the swarm method. And what that does is it actually creates a particle swarm. So like imagine like a million little gnats that get thrown out into the search space and they're like, Pew! <laughs> so it puts them all over the place. And then it again runs the fitness function 
and it determines which ones are doing the best. And the ones that are doing the best kind of attract other ones towards it, but they might be over here. So what could happen is like this is over here in the search space and it's doing really well. And this is over here and it's not doing as well. And it starts to come towards it. But as it come towards it, it might actually find a better spot in which case it becomes the best. And then the other ones start to get attracted to it. So it's kind of a swarm mentality where you just throw out all these random points and then it kind of like finds its way towards the, the whichever one happens to have the best solution at the time. Um, and that can actually be very good and it can actually be a bit faster than the other methods if it works. It doesn't tend to be as popular these days as other techniques that are used, but it can be quite effective and it can be uh, a very good way to solve the problem. I think the, the sort of general takeaway of all of this, no matter what you use, and there are many other solutions, this is just what I can think of off the top of my head, is that what you're looking for is an effective fitness function that really, really encapsulates what the problem is. And that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. It, it's not obvious a lot of times what exactly the fitness function is or what the the function you're trying to recreate is. You're just, you just have a search space and you don't know exactly what the answer is ahead of time. So that's a, that's a challenge. Then of course you have to have the data to do it. But then what you're trying to do is find something that's good enough. So if you had to have the exact answer, for example, like if you were trying to break a password or something like that, you actually need the exact answer. Like something good enough is not good enough. But for many, many problems, you just need something that's close. It has to be close to the right answer. It doesn't have to be the right answer. And under those circumstances, these things work great. They will give you a good enough answer that will be quite effective in doing something like figuring out how to effectively cut a forest without killing the forest and getting the best amount of logging out of it. Um, you know, it's all sorts of problems that you can come up with. Uh, logistical problems, like how to deal with the logistics of a warehouse and manufacturing. And I guarantee you that places like Amazon <laughs> probably have some pretty crazy algorithms that they're throwing at this. And again, that's one of those situations where there's probably not a perfect solution to the logistics of dealing with Amazon warehouses and distribution. But what they're looking for is a good enough answer, right? So the closer they can get to the perfect solution, the better off they are because they're saving money and getting things to customers faster along with AliExpress and, you know, whoever else. But uh, it, but that sort of thing is really important because that's money and time and profit and all of those things are wrapped up in getting a good enough solution and the good enough needs to get better and better and better towards the actual optimal solution. But it doesn't have to be there. It just has to be close. And those are the kinds of situations where you can really achieve a great deal through these types of machine learning algorithms to try to find the optimal or close to optimal solution to a search space. Hopefully that answers. <laughs> Give myself a thumbs up for that one, since I know that I at least have some of the right answers here. I hope this was a fun and interesting follow up to the other question. And thank you to the viewer who asked that question. I appreciate that. If you have any other questions, by all means, ask in the comments or at drknowitallknows at gmail.com. And make sure you like and subscribe for more of these. And definitely, if you have other follow-up questions to any of the stuff that I've done before, make sure you ask, because I'm happy to follow up and answer more thoroughly about our specific questions. So, yeah, by all means, ask. Until then, bye-bye. <laughs>